Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Brett Murdoch of Synopsys, who's going to talk today about DDR5 training. So, Brett, every time we, we open up a, a device and every time we turn it on, do we have to retrain the DDR? Typically, most of the time, the answer is yes. In fact, almost all devices will do that, with a few exceptions. So when you boot up, you'll go through a, a training algorithm. Uh, it can be very rigorous or it can be very light, depending on your application, depending on your IP. Uh, and then that device will be hopefully thoroughly trained, and you'll have a nice robust link in between your host and your device so that you don't drop any bits on the floor when you start actually running your applications. Is this sort of like burning in your memory every time you use it? You could think of it in that way. Uh, again, certainly every time you boot up, you want to make sure that you train the interface very thoroughly. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't have any opportunities for system noise or an interesting mission mode corner case of traffic to throw off your bitstream between the two host, uh, between your host and your device. So why don't you show us how this works? Sure thing. Let's dive right in. So, Brett, what are we looking at here? Well, today what we're going to talk about is, again, training between the Phi and the memory device. And whether that's a memory device that's a package on package, like you'll find in your mobile device, whether it's devices soldered on the board, or something like you see pictured here where there's a DIMM uh, on a PCB. In the end, no matter what your configuration, the robust training is really the key between having a high reliability solution or having a marginal solution. So what goes wrong? What, what do you have to keep in mind when you're doing this? Well, the big thing you need to keep in mind is making sure that when you train, you really push the interface hard so that, again, once you get into that mission mode of operation, you don't find yourself overstressing the interface in a way that you didn't anticipate when you actually did your training. This is one of the ways that a firmware-based training algorithm can really shine compared to a traditional hardware-based training algorithm. So what are we looking at now? So this shows a little bit of an illustration of a traditional hardware-based training algorithm in use. Uh, typically, it's a very simple pattern. Uh, it often has accesses that are sparsely spaced out. So you can see in the illustration, in the animation, uh, sometimes I'm passing data back and forth between the host and the device, and sometimes I'm not. Uh, and the problem with this is it doesn't necessarily catch all the conditions to get you to a truly worst case operating mode. And the problem with that, of course, then, is if you're not stressing it in worst case, you're not really getting to mimic what you could potentially see once you start running mission mode applications on your device. And that includes everything from more, more data than what you were used, used to using before. It could also include potentially thermal conditions that you didn't expect to, right? Just about anything can come at you that you haven't anticipated. So again, when you use a very simple algorithm, you leave yourself open to problems in the future. So what's the result of all of that? Well, the result is what your data eye looks like. So let's walk through what a typical data eye is gonna look like. So here I show uh, a data eye for read data. So this is the FIS view of the system coming into it. And I have on the axis, so the uh, vertical axis is the reference voltage. And then on the horizontal axis, I have the strobe delay. And there's a few different colors in the diagram I'll go over. The black area in the middle, that's where I don't see any kind of failures whatsoever. I'm getting good data transfer between the host and the device. Then when you see just a little bit of shading, that's going to indicate that I found at least one failure there. As you move farther out from the eye, you'll see the orange shading where I have anywhere from 2 to 15 failures experienced. And then once I get all the way on the outside to the solid red area, this is where I have 16 or more failures. So if I take away the key here and I look just at my data eye with the simple hardware-based training algorithm, I have a fairly nice looking data eye. It's fairly big, it's very pretty, and it's fairly easy for me to find a nice center tap point, both in terms of reference voltage and strobe delay. So I have what appears to me to be a very good margin around where I'm going to set my FIS operating condition to be. And this is the way I'll do it if I have a traditional hardware-based training engine. So going into the future, what changes? So using the firmware-based training algorithm, what this allows us to do is to really stress the interface more. 
So here again, I show the data I. And this is, in fact, this data I and the previous data I were captured on the exact same hardware setup. The difference is for the previous data I that I captured, I reprogrammed the firmware to behave the same way a simple hardware-based training algorithm will behave. So it's flexible in that I can make that change, uh, but then the real value of the firmware-based training is I can stress the interface more. So here with the same hardware setup, but a different algorithm, you can see that I've pushed the data I more than I did in the past. And in fact, now I'm using 64,000 bit times of measurement for every one of these data points. So I'm really pushing hard. And when you're working with uh, DRAM of any sort, you don't necessarily know upfront how this is going to be used. So this is why it's really important, right? That's exactly right. Especially when we sell our IP to a customer, they'll tell us what their end application is, but their end user, just like our end user, can use that device in any way they want. And especially if you think about something like a, a processor, uh, you know, an Intel or AMD based processor, right? You, you put that processor on a motherboard that anybody's gone out and built, uh, and then anybody can go down to any electronic store and buy any DIMM and stick it into that socket and expect it to work. And so that's one of the strengths of a firmware-based training algorithm is that you can take that variability in the system environment and adapt to it no matter what you have going on. Let's dig into this a little bit. How does this actually look when you start really adding in the firmware? So here, again, I have an eye that's already been pushed very hard by the firmware-based training algorithm. You can see I have a still a good data eye, and I'm able to find a nice center tap point based on this data eye. What's really interesting, though, is if I take a look at this center tap point and this data eye, and I compare that to what I received on the exact same hardware using that hardware-based training algorithm, and you can see there's a shift the data I is smaller and the center of the data I has moved as well. And if I focus just on the actual tap points that were calculated, you can see that with my firmware based algorithm, I have maximum space around that tap point, both in terms of voltage and delay. But if I look at the tap point I used by calculating from the hardware based algorithm, I have reduced voltage margin compared to my firmware voltage margin and I have reduced delay margin compared to my firmware-based training center point. The end result is the firmware-based training algorithm produces a significantly more reliable link between the host and the device. So how does this actually compare to what was done in the past with hardware-based training? What's the difference? Well, in addition to providing a more reliable and robust link between the host and the device, it also allows you that easy path to upgrade. Consider a couple of different case studies. Let's look at LPDDR5, which is a standard that has been released just over a year ago. It came out in February of 2019, 442-page standard. It had significant architectural changes from LPDDR4 and 4X, yet the specification had hundreds of places that said TBD. Then just in January of this year, they released an updated version. 546 pages, more than 100 additional pages, nine of which, full nine pages of which talked about highlighting changes and additions to the previous version of the specification. And this is one of the problems we've been running into with all technology right now, right? Because almost everything is in transition. We have new markets in AI and machine learning. We have new markets that are coming in all along the edge, nobody has any idea how these things are actually going to be utilized in the future, and memory is a key part of this whole thing. Exactly right. The memories keep updating, and the memories update on different for different reasons. The JEDEC specification gets updated, as we just saw. Uh, the memory manufacturers and the vendors, they'll update their silicon verbs of the memory. They want to shrink the lithographies to get more value out of every die. And sometimes it doesn't exactly behave the same way it did previously. So there's a lot of changes that can happen in a system, from things that are known to things that are unknown. And then, of course, you also have to consider the things that are unknown to begin with. As an example, another case study, the DDR5 specification. Everybody knows it's coming. Everybody's excited about it, but it still hasn't actually been published yet. Today, we're on Rev 0.99F. It's a 499-page document. There's significant architectural changes from DDR4. And there's a bunch of new training algorithms that you have to consider for DDR5 compared to DDR4. Chip select training, command address training, new VREP trainings, 
and DDR5 introduces DFE to the device, something that wasn't comprehended in DDR4. So in an SOC, what actually changes? How does that adapt to all these different changes? You've got a lot of complexity going on here and a lot of components that rely on DRAM in order to be able to function. As we saw earlier in our discussion, already the firmware-based training offers an advantage in terms of the robust link that it can train. And now we've just had the discussion about how you can easily update the firmware. As you mentioned, the memories are changing, the applications are changing, but it's hard for an SOC to change. If there's a change in the memory device, either due to specification or due to an issue, if your SOC is based on a hardware training engine, now you have to go out and do a new mask set for your chip. If you have a firmware-based training algorithm, you just re-image your firmware and move on. So there's a lot of advantages, both in terms of quality of actual interconnect between the host and the device for firmware, as well as ease of use and lower dollar cost, lower total cost of ownership with a firmware-based training algorithm system. And Brett, will this be the same for DDR4, DDR5, and all the different flavors of, of uh, DRAM that are out there? It absolutely will. So whether you're using a standard DRAM or a low-power DRAM, having a firmware-based engine will give you a more robust link between your host and your device, no matter your system configuration, no matter your end application, and no matter the memory device you've chosen. How about HBM? Where does that fit in? That's a great question. Uh, HBM actually is a much more tightly constrained and well-defined interface. So you don't necessarily need the same amount of heavy lifting in your training algorithms that some of the standard DDR and low-power protocol DDRs need because of the variability in system configurations and topologies. But Murdoch, thanks for a great explanation. Well, thank you, Ed. I really appreciate you talking with me today about this.